May I also add that as the panelists are speaking, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the questions. I'm sorry. I didn't notice her. I was so muted. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Um, I'll be talking about pre-surgical implant orthopedics. Because this is a panel discussion, I'm going to be quite brief while focusing on our experiences at the Lagos University General Hospital in particular. So what is pre-surgical implant orthopedics? It refers to all the procedures Alors, that are carried out, including obstetric procedures, to mold the maxillary, alveolar, and nasal tissues of an infant with unilateral or bilateral cleft lip and palate, primary to the prior to the primary surgery. PSIO is an umbrella term that covers any treatment of PSIO an infant before the definitive lip surgery. Qui couvre, qui Many of these procedures are possible enfants, because of the high level. Of the uh, avant, um, maternal hormones still present in the child in the first six months of child. Avant la it première makes, makes the avila uh, bone very pliable and moldable. These procedures include maxillary plates, lip strapping, lip additions, use of the Cette latent material. Procedure includes the avila molding appliance. La lèvre, la désion de la lèvre. No. The NAM appliance, of all the appliances I mentioned with respect to physiological infant orthopedics, the NAM appliance has been reported to be the most effective of all the PSIOs, particularly with respect to the improvement of the nasal form and nasolabial aesthetics. Now, this difference or this significant change that occurs in children who receive the NAM appliance has been, is, is backed by evidence from randomized clinical trials. Um, the NAM appliance was developed by Dr. Barry Grayson and the dentist and a plastic surgeon, so-called Kutin in the 1990s. It was basically most pre-surgical infant orthopedic appliances can be divided into NAM and non-NAM appliances, particularly because of the significant relevance of the NAM appliance in terms of the outcome um, with respect to nasolabial, um, nasolabial form and aesthetics. Randomized clinical trials have shown that the non-NAM appliances like the molding plates, the latent appliance, offer no significant advantage over the NAM. Some of the math trials have also shown that with some of the non-NAM appliances, there were no significant changes observed in patients over a long period of time. What is our experience in Luth? Um, orthodontic care has been provided for patients with cleft and palate for over 20 years now as part um, of the comprehensive team care in Luth. During this period, PSIO, PSIO has formed an integral part of the orthodontic care that we provide. Um, Using the last, um, in terms of percentages, I'm going to use the last one year in terms of the percentage of different forms of PSI we, we have used for our patients. We no longer use feeding plates. We used that in the early days, but when the evidence showed that it didn't add much value, we, we, we stopped with that. Um, we still do lip strapping. In the past one year, about 30% of our patients have, have undergone lip strapping. More recently, we introduced the NAM appliance. And over the past one year, about 55% of our patients have received the NAM appliance. We also more recently started doing, using Dynacleft elevators. And in the past one year, about 5% of our patients have received the Dynacleft, Dynacleft elevators. Most recently, we started using the DNAM, which is the 3D printed um, nasal alveolar molding appliance using CAD CAM technology. And we have had a number of patients also um, who have benefited from this. The four pictures on the screen show some of our patients that have received some of the appliances that I've just mentioned. Lip strapping on the top left, uh, uh, on, on the right hand, the top right hand corner, you can see the NAM appliance, the Dynacleft ele elevator on the lower left, and um, the DNAM appliance, which is, like I described earlier, the um, CAD CAM fabricated um, 
plates that we are able to use, well, that we more recently started using for our patients that allows to, us to close both alveolar segments with precision while performing all the other functions we we'll already have carried out with the regular NAMA plans. So what are the benefits that we can say that have occurred from uh, the provision of PSI to our patients based on our experience in Luth? Approximation of the lip segments, particularly in wide and bilateral clefts, thus facilitate, facilitating the surgical repair of the defects. Retraction and derotation of prominent premaxillary segments, improved feeding, improved nasal symmetry and nasolibial aesthetics. I put that in red because that particular benefit has been already justified in literature using the highest level of, um, highest level of studies. Meta-analysis have proven that. Reduced cost and need for secondary surgery for nose revision. So it follows that because of the improved nasal asymmetry that you can get, particularly from um, appliances like the NAM appliance or the Dynacleft elevator, that it reduces the need for secondary surgery and that ultimately reduces the cost that can work and also reduce the cost of care, particularly surgical care for our patients. And then one key benefit that we have always spotted and, and has been reported in literature um, is the psychological benefits to the mother and the caregiver in the sense that they are happy that they, are, they notice that the child is receiving attention one. Very often there's an improvement in the appearance of the cleft defect, particularly in very wide or um, in bilateral clefts where you have a very prominent premaxillary segment in which PSI is able to bring that segment and approximate the cleft segments closer, giving a more aesthetic appearance. And so psychologically, the parents feel happy that something is being done and something is actually being done for their child. However, we all know that there are challenges. The first one is the cost. There's a cost on many levels, cost of providing the care, cost to the patient in the terms that, in terms of the fact that the patient has to come in for repeated appointments, and that comes with the cost. And we know that some of our patients are not particular, many of them are in the low socioeconomic class. And this aspect of care has, has been, we have to thank Smile Train for this, for the sponsorship that we provide, because they have provided care from both angles. They have actually been able to support us in providing PSIUs and also provide some level of financial assistance to the patients to be able to keep up with the frequent appointments that are required to provide most of these PSIO um, options, particularly the NAMA appliance and its corollaries. Of course, there's also the high level of compliance required from the parents and the caregiver. We know that for these appliances, they have to routinely change the tapes. And so the, the parents have to be very, parents, the caregivers, particularly the mothers have to be very heavily involved. And a high level of compliance is required from them in order to achieve significant outcomes. And so, in this wise, but what we have noticed is that most parents are, are, are very eager to provide, um, to cooperate and give, do whatever is required to make their children better. So when we talk about evidence-based practice and PSI, we know that evidence-based practice requires or refers to providing the best level of care, which has been validated, validated by three major things, current research findings. And when we talk about current research findings, we're looking at the highest level of evidence most likely meta-analysis from randomized clinical trials in conjunction with the clinical experience of the, of, of the clinician and the patient's preference. These three factors, when we talk about evidence-based practice, are the pivots for evidence-based practice. So in our own environment, although RCTs have not been done on PSIOs in this environment, we can state that based on other RCTs that have been done outside our environments, and even more importantly, our clinical experience and our patient's feedback, that these reinforce or continue to convince us that the, we can continue to use the PSIs, particularly NAM appliance and NAM related appliance in this environment while providing the best level, uh, in order to provide the best level of care to our patients based on evidence-based practice principles. In conclusion, PSIO currently forms an important aspect of the orthodontic care provided for patients with collective and in our environment. This is supported by the evidence available to us and the positive outcomes and feedback provided by both surgeons and the patients, the patients, parents, and caregivers. So what recommendations do we have? We know that currently there is very limited um, evidence in our own environment. A lot of studies have been done worldwide um, and, and literature is replaced with those. One of the shortcomings of all these studies is because of the, the, the nature of cleft care where you have different centers having different standards and different times of outcome measures. So 
there are very few randomized controlled clinical trials that have actually been done worldwide. Very few of them have actually been done. But we don't have even have any in our own environment that compares the short and long-term benefits of PSIO. Now, this is important. It's important that we have these studies carried out and that this study should also include reported outcome measures from our own patients and their caregivers. These studies will provide us with scientific evidence that will further guide our use of these appliances. These studies should also be extended to the aspects of health care in our environment. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Isikwe. That was precise. And so next will be Dr. Lutayo James. He is an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, also at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Lagos, Nigeria. And he will be sharing from his perspective as an oral and maxillofacial surgeon involved in repair of cleft lip and palate patients. Dr. James. Please unmute yourself, Dr. James. Yes, I'm trying to share my slide. So you still can't see the, the share sharing option is not showing on my system. When you click on your screen, you should have it under. When you click on your screen, you should see it under. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone. And happy to be here. Just want to share our experience. And I'll be talking from the Sogion perspective based on these um, outlines. We know that um, artificial clefts are present with gaps and small development along embryonic um, development line. And you have diverse presentations. So the topic of the day relates to the lip, cleft lip. And that's why I'm showing this. We have different presentations. What are the two challenges that we have as a surgeon um, in cleft? We have problem with the soft tissue and hard tissue. For the soft tissue, we have a muscle imbalance. This orientation, because the gap prevents the muscle from proper attachment. So that's this orientation causes muscle imbalance. And because the muscles are not really functional, the tissue are apoplastic. And so you have an apoplastic tissue to work with. And if you look at the heart tissues, we have skeletal anomalies. We have cleft line on the, uh, the, the bone skeleton. And that one may call, cause asymmetry or malalignment. And we are talking of a um, bilateral cleft lip. You have anomaly of the prolibium, which may be prognatic, there may be rotation. And as you have, can see in this uh, picture, there is distortion of the nasal apparatus, the the is fled, and the cartilages is mal positioned. So all these factors will actually affect uh, our surgery. As a surgeon, what do I want to achieve when I'm, I'm repairing cleft? I want aesthetics. I want my patient to come out and if possible, nobody will know that I've ever done any surgery. Then I want those tissues to be functional again. Those tissues that have been rendered infunctional by the cleft, I want them to function again. And this one can be achieved by application of basic principle, guiding soft tissue dissection. Most of our patients are, are newly their babies and want to apply this thing so that we can get good results, good aesthetic and good function. So we want to identify their anatomical landmarks. No landmarks they are there, 
want to ad identify them and, and bring them together for surgery. We want to do minimal soft tissue dissection. These are gross skeleton. By the time you dissect too much, you have scarification, which may affect the growth of the skeleton. So if I have my way, I don't want to do much dissection. Of course, I want to oppose my wound along anatomical planes so that I can get good aesthetics. I want to switch up my wound in layers with minimal tension. So for me to achieve this, I need my tissue to be appropriately placed. Uh, these are challenging cases for surgeon. The first one, unilateral cleft, this cleft is wide. And if I'm going to repair this as a surgeon, I need to really undermine, mobilize, and dissect, which I want to guide against if I have my way. The other one, of course, is unilateral, bilateral cleft. The problem is badly rotated. And it's not a case that I will, I will smile at as a surgeon when I see. Uh, if I can get things that will rotate it and prepare it uh, and get it put up a proper place for me, I'll prefer it. One of our recent um, study, we try to look at this problem. That does initial width of cleft play a role in the occurrence of middle local communication for the primary cleft repair? We look at 70 of our patients and we look at the gap, the cleft uh, width. And we, look, we found out that as the width is increasing, the likelihood of getting complication, we are talking of immediate complication, the hissense, wound infection, uh, notching, the, it actually increases. And we're able to identify a critical level of 40 mm, that when the cleft width is above 40 mm, it's likely you are going to get complication. And looking at this case, this is what we have. So this case was um, one of the cases that was given to our orthodontist. You see the pre Mizabula modern case, a very badly case. And it has been, after working on it, after they've done the, the, the pre-surgical infant of the ortho, orthopedics, this is what they gave me, which I'm very happy with. So the effect of this procedure uh, that we have seen here that make, that make this surgery easier for me, the anatomical landmark is more prominent. Having aligned it, you can see the first rotated um, picture. I couldn't even make up anything out of it. But this properly positioned prolibium, I could identify the landmark, which makes my surgery easier. The alignment of maxilla alveola segment also is a very positive and happy something for me. It will help me to do this surgery better. There's the rotation of alignment of prolibium, which is very good for me. Correction and malposition of nasal cartilages. And the, the nasal cartilages are better positioned. And so my surgery will actually be better than the initial uh, presentation. Uh, a very good advantage for me uh, is the, the clefts have been really narrowed. So if I'm going to do this surgery now, I need limited dissection and advancement, which is one of my, uh, one of my objectives I want to achieve. So all this simplify the cleft and allow application of basic cleft surgery principles. And when I have this, I have a better uh, result. So in conclusion, pre-surgical and orthopedics facilitates the application of basic principles of cleft surgery. And this one give me a better surgical outcome. And based on our experience in boots in my center, it's a recommended procedure, especially for complex cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. James. Um, you broke down the aims and objectives of the surgical repair very easily. And I was beginning to think that maybe I could repair surgical, carry out a surgical repair myself. Thank you very much, Dr. James. All right. So now we'll be listening to Dr. Adeola Olusoya, who is also an oral and maxillofacial surgeon at at the University College Hospital in Ibadan, Nigeria. Dr. Lusoya, please. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. We, um, I'll, I'll try to sh share my slide now. Okay, can you see my slide now? Yes, we can. Can I quickly remind right. our participants that you can- 
Put your questions in the question and answer box. Thank you. Go ahead, Ma. All right. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Adiola Olusanya from UC. I'll be speaking on behalf of our team at the University College Hospital Ibadan. Um, my um, colleagues have shed um, quite a bit of light on the introduction of uh, this topic, and I'll be using the outline that I've um, listed out uh, to give this presentation. Um, to build on what has been said or to confirm on what, what has been said, the uh, pre-surgical infant orthopedics mainly deals with uh, cleft lip and palate anomaly, which is about the most common uh, congenital craniofacial anomaly. And there have been several um, uh, attempts, measures, in order to improve the outcome of this uh, surgical repair over the years. The uh, PSIO for shorts is one of such uh, measures. What PSIO does um, generally is to bring the uh, structures of the nasolabia region at the maxillary uh, uh, arch into a more favorable position for uh, surgical repair. Um, the benefits that have been given to uh, PSIO in different forms that exist are a bit controversial. And um, I, would, I would first of all try to go through how common this uh, practice is. I try to do a bit of a search and PSIO appears not to be a very common um, therapy. Considering the um, ACP accredited, accredited centers, about 30 or 50% in America actually undertake this procedure. And in some other uh, countries like in Korea, with, uh, during a survey of senior residents in um, orth orthodontic uh, departments, about 19% um, actually are involved in PSIO. And here in Nigeria also, um, in a survey of 38 surgeons out of 44 cleft surgeons identified in a, a survey, only 5.3% reported the use of pre-surgical um, pre infant orthopedic devices. Um, so with that as baseline, I want to share what I experienced with PSIO has been uh, at our center. Before PSIO, which we started only a few years ago, we, at the time of repair, the uh, outcome of our cases may have been relatively okay when it comes to the leap element, but the nasal element had been uh, uh, an issue. And these cases uh, projected here are to show what um, the outcome has been like with follow-up of um, greater than four years. Sorry, um, Dr. Lusanya. Yes. Please slow down. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I thought I was. <laughs> Good. Uh, with the advent of PSI, which we started a few years ago, um, there are some criteria for eligibility for the therapy. And we um, do PSI for patients who are non-syndromic, patients who have complete cleft of the primary palate, which, which may be with second, secondary palate or not, unilateral or bilateral, and consenting uh, parents or caregivers. In way of protocol, um, parents are counseled on the pros and cons of PSIO with the understanding that they can disengage from the therapy anytime they wish. And usually we commence the PSIO between the first week of life and the sixth week. We usually don't uh, take on patients after the sixth week of life for several reasons. Um, that said, all patients who are enrolled usually have their lips repaired as soon as they fulfill the criteria for surgery. And 
from uh, our experience so far, it takes an average of eight to 10 clinic visits to complete a therapy for PSIO. In our center, there are basically four forms of PSIO that we prescribe, which are dependent on the type of cleft and the distance of the, the uh, parents or caregiver from the center, and then the capabilities of the parents or caregiver. So I'll go through the um, uh, prescriptions that we have. We have lip taping alone, and we usually do this when the parent or caregiver prefers it after counseling on PSIO, or it's, it's given as an alternative to failure to complete um, NAM after it has been commenced, which can also be for several reasons. Then we have nasal taping, and I mean nasal traction with lip taping. This is usually prescribed for uh, patients who have primary palate um, alone, especially if it's with an incomplete alveolar cleft. And then also when uh, parents or caregivers cannot cope with the placement of the maxillary plates. Then the third uh, prescription is nasal traction with maxillary plates. This is prescribed when distance from the center is an issue because patients can take it and then they can uh, cope with it for longer periods of time before having to return to the clinic. And then when uh, parents or caregiver they find it ten technically challenging to cope with the NAM device as a single unit. Now, nasoalveolar molding device as a single unit is the fourth type of prescription that we have. And this we prescribe when uh, pat patients uh, live not too far from the center and distance is not an issue. And also for patients, uh, uh, parents who are well motivated and they are technically savvy to handle the device. Since the advent of um, PSIO in our center, we've had this kind of outcome, which have been very encouraging. And we've also had a uh, significant benefit, mainly in the nasolabia region. If you compare the before NAM uh, pictures here to the after NAM pictures, the benefits of the nasolabia region, they are not as profound in the uh, bilateral cases those ones are usually pretty challenging. And they, I think in my opinion that they are the ones that can really benefit the most um, from, from nasoaviolar mode because of the absence of the columella that is associated with the, this type of anomaly. But so far, we started roughly about a year and a half ago and we have uh, like a year follow-up of our patients and the, the results have been encouraging. Yes, this, there are controversies and the controversies I think um, include if this positive aesthetic outcome are sustained over time. There are several studies in literature who, uh, that are trying to address this. Also, to, uh, there are also controversies on whether PSIO can help with nutrition. There are studies that say that they don't, some say that they do. And then the effect of PSIO on, mid -fish, on the mid face is also a, a question that is um, needing some answers. Um, and if the uh, PSIO would reduce the need for the number of revision surgeries, there are uh, positive responses to this in literature. The impact of uh, PSI or on future orthodontic intervention also need to be researched into. Basically, the systematic reviews that are available mainly support, um, uh, should I say, more commonly the nasolabial uh, aesthetic outcome of uh, PSI. Now, for recommendations, uh, while I'm aware that there are that it is possible to achieve acceptable results, even without PSIO in some unilateral cases. I would still propose or, or 
or recommend that PSIO should be undertaken for uh, quite a number of selected cases, especially those that are complete in the nature of the anomaly. And based on the uh, uh, encouraging outcome that we have seen, I will strongly recommend PSIO, especially for the bilateral cases. I will also recommend detailed documentation of cases in centers that offer this uh, therapy. So as we can have um, RCTs on long-term outcome, uh, those randomized control trials on long-term outcome of PSIO, so which can help to enlighten the controversies surrounding PSIO. Studies on the burden of care of this uh, therapy on parents and caregivers are also very desirable. So these are my references and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Lusoya, for that beautiful presentation. Um, speaking next will be Dr. Taiwo Moshebi. He is a plastic and reconstructive surgeon at the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital, Lagos, Nigeria. Dr. Moshebi, please. A lot has been said about the advantage and disadvantage of uh, PSIO and to do or not to do. So I won't waste too much of time looking at what has been actually discussed by the earlier speakers. They've shown so many of this uh, pattern that we can see when we have a uh, orofacial cleft uh, com complications. They've also highlighted the different methods and the objectives of using uh, PSIO, but the pros and cons, the benefits of pre-surgical nasoalveolar molding and other components of PSIO have been debated as we are still doing today. Some of the reported disadvantages and complications includes the ones that I've highlighted here that has been documented that it could interfere with growth, that it obviously delays surgery because of the length of time. So I'm happy when the uh, doctor, sorry, the last speaker said that it does not intervene so much. At any point in time, when the child is qualified for surgery, they stop the uh, PSIO treatment and the child can have surgery. There's also risk of infection. And when it involves the use of a NASA molding, there has been documentation about the possibility of occlusion of the airway, depending on the um, prone, pro prowess of the caregiver, because this is not done in the hospital all the time. And there's also the risk of ulceration under a plate, under the plate or skin sores, even from the tape, if it is not properly applied and done. For us in Lasso, uh, incidentally, we have not been using the PSI ho in our care. And I've just gone back to our records to look at uh, the images of the pictures we have between the period indicated uh, on, the, on the screen here. And uh, this gives us about, uh, sorry. This gives us about 61 for that period indicated. Now let's look at some of the pictures that we have seen without the use of um, any form of uh, pre-surgical uh, orthodontics in these infants. That's a pre, that's a post. Although we could say that the prolabium is uh, properly aligned here on like some of the ones that we had seen earlier. But then again, let's progress. We can also see some of the pictures we have been able to get in terms of results without the use of a PSIO. Okay, that's another baby there with bilateral lip. Now this is unilateral lip in this baby. It's also, there's been some dental malalignment and all that, and yet we were able to come across this. Okay, 
Now, we may be wondering if that post-op is not, but on a closer look, we can still appreciate uh, some of the alignments that we are getting, okay? So for us, as picture speaks for what we have been doing, as already mentioned by most of the speakers earlier, most surgeons will agree that their chance of achieving a final surgical scar, a good NASA T projection, and the more symmetrical and precisely defined nasolabial complex will be better than an infant who presents with a smaller cleft deformity. But then for wider deformities, how much has PSI Hill contributed to achieving this in my center? So far, I would say it has not made any contribution for what we have been doing so far. And so, and so, we are not here to say no, that um, PSIO is not something that we can look at, but we are saying that without PSIO, we are getting results. So when you now look at some of the earlier mentioned disadvantages that uh, had been highlighted, you then want to weigh, do I want to invest so much in this if there is not going to be any significant difference with my outcome or, but, as mentioned by the last speaker, those are areas that are still open to randomized uh, clinical trial, control trial in all the centers so that we can see what is happening. Then we're talking about an infant. For us, we've also had experience of these people, even in adults, big adults for that matter. They still have this white thing. And uh, here, we're not going to be talking about um, pre-surgical because already the tissues here have been well developed and the uh, all we, this patient needs will be surgery. I'm not too sure of how much uh, PSI who would help this patient here. Then there are other form of clefts, clefts that probably will not also benefit from PSI who. Okay, even our cleft palates too. So we are not saying that we have done all we have without having complications. No doubt there are complications that we have also, uh, you know, seen in our practice. However, like this uh, uh, palatal uh, cleft here that had now resulted into this uh, fistula. But with or without PSIO, are we getting the results? For us, we have been getting our results with, without PSIO. And I want to say thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Moshebi, for sharing your perspective. And our last panelist for today will be Dr. Hayden Beladi. He is a professor of orthodontics at the University of the Western Cape. Dr. Hayden, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll go to share screen. That's not the right one. What? We shared screen earlier and it works. What's happening now? There we go. Right, good morning everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me to be part of the panel. And also thank you very much to all the uh, speakers. It's been a very interesting morning so far some great uh, presentations. I'm going to approach things slightly differently. As you can see from the color of my hair, I've been around quite a bit. I started cleft care working with Dr. Brian Summerlad, who I'm sure you've all heard of in the UK. And at that time, we used quite a lot of pre-surgical orthopedics. And it wasn't until some years later that we changed. We weren't working together at the time. I'd already come to work in Cape Town. So if I could just highlight what was uh, published by Gunvar Sem in 2005 as part of the ScanClef trials, where they looked at the number of visits and the treatment time for those children who did have pre-surgical orthopedics. And it lasted for up to 15 months of treatments and up to 17 visits 
And in some cases, the children were kept in hospital for 146 days. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's an incredible burden. All right, the approach is very different these days, but we have to consider the burden of care. Why is my slide not going? And the burden of care includes this whole range of um, effects. You know, how much time do the parents... <laughs> Sorry, my dog. Um, how much time do the children, do the parents have to take from work? How much time do the children take from school? What are the total number of visits to all the specialists? And don't forget, these children also suffer from normal childhood illnesses. Who's going to cover the cost of transport? Who's going to cost the, um, cover the cost of treatment? What happens to family dynamics? Sibling relationships. You know, the one child sees their sister or their brother having so much more attention paid to them. How does that interfere with them psychologically? We've also got to think of the educational achievements of these children. And there have been a number of publications recently where it's shown that children with clefts do not achieve the same levels at school as those without clefts. And this is possibly, possibly a consequence of the amount of time that they have lost off school. And ultimately, of course, we have to think of the quality of life. So there are a number of different appliances and approaches to pre-surgical orthopedics, and these are just the variety that I was brought up with. But as I say, my approach changed from about the late 1990s to into the early 2000s, where a number of publications were made showing that no benefit with feeding, time, weight gain and growth compared to comparing samples with and without feeding appliances. The randomized control trials that were published from uh, studies in Holland in the late 90s and uh, early 20s showed very little difference between approximation of arch, arch segments with and without appliances. They also looked at a later stage at the nasal and lip repair appearance and again, found no differences there. Some of the negative findings they did find though were that within six months of um, fitting an, an appliance, the children had karyogenic oral flora. Now that's a year before any teeth erupt into the arch. I'll mention the other day for you. So, you know, the important things I think are well-conducted trials that show the benefits as opposed to the burden of treatment. So is there evidence that the treatment we're providing improves the outcome? A recent uh, publication in the CPCJ is a systematic review of the long-term effects of pre-surgical orthopedic devices on patients. Now you'll see that their conclusions uh, following a review of 30 articles there was no report of consensus as to the long-term effects of these devices. Furthermore, the study showed only 10% of published res research included confounding factors that could influence the reported results. And these confounding factors were identified, were different surgical protocols, different surgeons, different rates of, um, and revision of surgeries. So there are a number of facts that still need to be considered when you're looking at the results that are published. Um, and I think that is really the crux of the matter. The publications need a huge amount of scrutiny. So if we come on to strapping or dynocleft, which is the least invasive of these um, um, approaches to treatment. We find two publications recently in the CPJ from Egypt and another one from India, which follows. The one from Egypt's conclusion was that it seems that taping alone is an efficient tool in changing the maxillary arch dimensions Mm, surgical lip repair in patients with unilateral cleft palate. So in their sample, they found that 
Diana Clef type taping was as good in changing the maxillary arch dimensions as the um, NAM appliance. The Indian study was a comparative study of pre-surgical infant orthopedic orthopedics with modified Grayson appliance compared to Dynaclef with nasal elevations. Their conclusions were that both methods proved effective in improving the nasal asymmetry, the alveolar cleft gap, and approximating the lips together. But don't forget, these are all, all both studies that have been um, looked at in the short term. We really need to look at the long term. And that's not going to be effective until the patients, what, in their teens? So we've got to be collecting material for close to 20 years. I'm involved with the Scancleft study at the moment. And that study started collecting material in 1999. The last patient they recruited into the study was in um, 2011. So that was 12 years just to recruit the number of patients to provide robustness and stability to the, to the um, study. 445 unilateral cleft lip and palate patients. It's very hard to maintain studies over that length of time. And in fact, the chief investigator has um, recently had to retire. But by the time in 2026, when all of those patients will have achieved the age of 18, that is a, that's the only time that they're going to start being able to assess the long-term effects of these, uh, of any devices or appliances. So I'm just going to show you some of the orthodontic outcomes that we've uh, we assessed when I was working in Manchester on groups of patients where no pre-surgical orthopedics was uh, provided. So um, we looked first at the occlusal outcomes of orthodontic treatment in patients with unilateral cleft lip and palate. I'll just show you some graphs to show that the improvement, most with the unilateral cleft lip and palate patients, most of the improvements were in greatly improved, with some only in the improved section none in the worse or no different. For the bilateral patients, mostly, most were in the greatly improved and two were the improved. So not surprisingly, we got better results with the bilateral patients than we did with the um, unilateral patients. And this is a graph of 200 consecutive patients showing it is possible to get most of the patients into the greatly improved area and only some in the improved area, but none were worse or no different. This is using the power index. And it's just a, it's an indication, I think, of how good results can be achieved in patients where there has been very little um, treatment at an early stage. So when we looked at the orthodontic audit standards, the Manchester group we had an 82% increase in improvement compared to an audit standard for cleft patients of 69% and non-cleft patients of 75%. So that was a huge difference. We also had no patients who were less than 70% improved. So our conclusions were that the final pass score for cleft units was about 69%. The non-cleft units of 75% and that's the we managed to achieve close to 83%. Another uh, paper that we've just had published was the results of 200 consecutive bone grafts. Again, the same group of patients, no pre-surgical orthopedics. We managed to achieve a 99% success rate in the bone grafts with 92.5% achieving a grade one. That's over 185 patients in, out of 200 achieved grade one success. And I think one of what these papers indicate is that the high success rate reported in these studies um, 
supports the favorable outcomes of high volume cleft operations. Um, this is just a recent paper that was uh, sort of published in CPJ, CJ this year, so showing that the Aliak crest bone graft is the ideal position for at least the ideal material for um, alveolar bone grafts. So I hope that's just given you some ideas of what can be looked at in terms of outcomes, but also give you an idea of the difficulty of establishing a robust, successful, long-term study where you can look at the outcomes. And with cleft patients, it's mostly in the late, later teenage years where growth is finished, where we're going to be able to come to any real conclusions. Looking at patients at five years of age is not going to give us any conclusions. So I encourage you all to establish your randomized control trials. I encourage you to collect material and as much material as you possibly can. Sky and Cleft, as I said, took 11 years to collect their 400 cases, and that's from at least five countries. So thank you very much, good luck, and I look forward to seeing your publications and your good results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayden. Um, we have one question in the Q&A box. Uh, unfortunately, the poster had to leave, but um, we will still address the question. So it says, there is clearly still a great deal of uncertainty and even controversy. As Dr. Isekwe has said, there is still no evidence of benefits either for surgical outcomes or psychosocial effects for the patient. In the absence of evidence, is it ethical to continue to promote PSIO or the NAM? And are there any research studies, whether RCTs or other types of researches being planned? Such studies, if and when planned, should acknowledge that there is a great deal of phenotypic heterogeneity in cleft types and severity. Should future studies be designed to acknowledge it and to have very precise definition and measurement of outcomes, both short and long term. Um, Dr. Isikwe, please, would you like to respond to this? Um, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Ewo. Uh, I think Professor Peter Morsi has also left. The, he said he had to leave for another meeting before, uh, not too long after posting this. I think he has asked many questions that we still need answers to, that we do not have answers to. If I start with his last three statements, which are questions. Um, do we need future studies to acknowledge the phenotypic, phenotypic heterogeneity in cleft types? True. Um, we also need to, bearing that in mind, we need to be able to define these different phenotypes and also acknowledge that outcome measures are very, very important, particularly in, in our own environment. Um, if I go back to the top, where he also asks that, um, based on the fact that we do not have evidence for surgical outcomes or psychosocial psychological effects of um, pre-surgical infant orthopedic treatment on parents. Um, yes, that's true. In fact, while preparing for this presentation, I, I did a search and found out that there was a paper published this year and a randomized, uh, a meta, a randomized clinical, uh, no, a systematic review was published this year. And the feedback from that review was that there was low evidence. Most of the published studies on the patient's satisfaction with the outcome of PSIO treatment were very low level, and so they couldn't come to any definite conclusion. So it, it shows that apart from our focus on outcomes, apart from our focus on the surgical outcomes, on outcomes on speech, on growth, both short and long term, it's important that we still need to carry out research on the parents and caregivers themselves and how they perceive the outcomes of the treatment that we provide. But having bearing that in mind, it's still important to ask ourselves, whatever we want to do ultimately is for the patient. We want to give the best to the patient. And so I think my personal opinion is that whatever um, when, when the argument comes of whether or not to do PSI for a given patient is taken in context of what that patient is presenting with. And then the team, that cleft team, 
has the responsibility to take a decision based on the complexity of the cleft, the benefits, the cost benefit analysis for each patient. And so I think um, we'll continue to make those uh, ethical decisions in conjunction with the patient and in, 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 of course with the patient's consent, making sure the patient knows what all the pros and cons for either treating with or without PSIO is. You know, but having shown the benefits, once we see that the benefits far outweigh the cost of the body to the patient, and that team feels that, that they will get the best outcome going that route, and they have the competence to provide that outcome, then it means they've taken an evidence-based decision and they, they can go ahead once they have the of the patient. So that's my opinion. But I agree Thank you with very Professor, much. Professor Mossi that we need a lot more research, randomized clinical trials, particularly in our own environment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sekwe. Um, short, before we go quickly, I have another question. It says, how can we search the long-term effects of pre-surgical orthopedics with all the other factors, factors affecting the cleft growth? Uh, Dr. Hayden, please, you want to respond to this? It says, how can we search the long-term effects of pre-surgical orthopedics with all the other factors affecting cleft growth? I don't know if um, you've looked at any of the AmeriCleft uh, publications or um, other similar uh, similar publications, but the AmeriCleft um, looks at the growth on patients using the Goslon yardstick. And in one of their centers, they found that close to, I don't know if you know the Goslon yardstick, it measures facial growth, it separates uh, facial growth into five separate categories. If the patient has uh, fallen into category one or two, they will not need maxillofacial surgery to realign the, um, the jaws. If they fit in facts uh, four and five, then they will have a severe class three malocclusion, which will mean there has been a lot of inhibition and growth of the mid face and they require automatic surgery to reposition the upper jaw. And in one of the centers in the AmeriCleft study, they actually found that close to 66% of their uh, patients required automatic surgery, compared to a level in um, some of the uh, Scandinavian countries, where at not even 20% in some centers require automatic surgery. So there are uh, there's also the five-year index, which they use in some parts of the UK, which means you can um, start looking at your outcomes at the age of five. But it just gives you an idea that um, Goslon is best looked at around about the age of 10. Um, and I know there are other indexes that are used, but you know, when you're applying, when you're measuring these indexes, I can tell you that the five and the Goslon are not up more straightforward. But, you know, so that means the earliest you can look at your outcomes is when the patient's five years of age. Um, better, better to do it at 10 years of age. So yes, it takes a long time. You've got to be consistent with collection of your records. You can't just pick up those that are the good results compared to the bad results. Things have to be properly collected and reported. As I say, good luck. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayden. Um, you will all agree with me. This has been quite an interesting session. And we have come to the end of today's panel discussion. Um, allow me to say a very big thank you to all the panelists, to all the participants that have joined us. Um, thank you for your time. Yes.